From the earliest age that I can recall, becoming a park ranger was my life goal. My father and I spent every free weekend hiking, fishing, and camping in Arlo Bennett National Forest. Not everyone is as lucky as we were to have access to 560,000 acres of pristine woodland, streams, and hiking trails, but with it being a 20-minute drive, we practically lived there from Friday afternoon to Sunday evening. While I could recount hundreds of stories of our exploits in the park, I think it would be best if I stick with the information pertinent to the dangers that I want to warn you of. When I was about 10 years old, my father and I had just finished setting up camp for the night. Our tent was placed, the latrine dug, and our campfire was burning warmly in front of us. After a heavy dinner and a canteen of water, the call of nature indicated that it was time to use the restroom. I wandered to the hole that we had dug away from camp and I relieved myself. As I was zipping my jeans there, a soft whistle coming was from the forest ahead of me. Looking over my shoulder, I could see my father, pipe in mouth, sitting on the ground by our fire. Turning back in the direction of the whistling, I squinted my eyes and peered into the distance to try and identify the source. It was likely a bird, I thought to myself, but there were hints of a subtle melody that kept me from being certain. The fading light of the sun didn't provide me with much of a view, so I continued listening to the soft whistling. Having decided that it warranted no further investigation, I resolved to return to the safety of my father's company and the now much desired illumination of our campfire. I turned around and began trudging through the undergrowth of the forest when, over my shoulder, I was certain that I had heard someone shout from a distance. It's this way. Come and see. My fight, flight, or freeze response immediately chose the worst of all the options as I stopped dead in my tracks. Turning around quickly, I looked in the distance and saw what I thought was the silhouette of someone far in the distance. One arm waved above their head as if to say hello. They didn't call out again, but it appeared a single arm continued to wave in above their head before they eventually dropped it and stepped backward disappearing behind a monstrously large oak tree. Without another thought, I bolted the short distance back to our campsite and in a panic, told my father what I thought I had seen and heard. He smiled and reassured me that it was likely nothing more than another camper, but he would investigate, shouldering the strap of his rifle and digging his flashlight out of his bag. We trekked into the woods in the direction I thought that I had seen the figure. My pulse thumped rapidly the farther from camp that we went. As we neared the massive oak that I had seen from the latrine, my father began to sweep the ground with the beam of the flashlight, searching for signs of a disturbance. There was no sign of recent activity. The dried leaves and fallen branches seemed to be completely undisturbed. We continued a quarter of a mile beyond the oak and still found no sign of another camp or any other human activity. My father ruffled my hair with his hand and assured me that it had just been my mind playing tricks on me. I wanted to believe him so badly, but something in my heart told me that I had seen someone or more unsettling yet, something. After getting back to our camp and settling beside the dwindling embers of our fire, my father did something that he had never done before. He began telling me a ghost story. In this forest, he started, people for over a century had told each other tales of wanderers in the woods. Beautiful melodies whistled in through the trees. Strangers in the distance would wave and beckon travelers to come and see incredible things. Anyone foolish enough to follow them vanished, never to be seen again. Not understanding why you would tell me these things, I began to panic and tears pulled in the corners of my eyes. Seeing the visible comfort, my father smiled and told me that, as a boy, he had thought that he had seen the same things too. My grandfather had told him the same story when he was my age or perhaps a bit younger. Every time, they would tread the same trails that he and I hiked now, 
he always imagined hearing or seeing the wanderers in the woods. When he told my grandfather what he had heard and seen, he took it as an opportunity to teach him that the whistling sound was a known call of a local bird. He would also find shapes in the distance and show him how inanimate objects at a distance could produce the illusion of a man or woman watching them. It could also be a practical joke, kiddo, he assured me. When an area has a popular urban legend, folks like to do what they can to stoke the fires. I began to calm down a bit. We were deep within a massive national forest and the odds of encountering another person were slim at best. My youthful fears had gathered natural occurrences around me and organized them into an unnerving and unlikely scenario. Even if it had been a person, I thought that he was right. They were trying to play a joke on us and I had fallen for it hook, line, and sinker. I used my posture substantially and smiled thankfully at my father. In all of our trips together after that, I never had the same experience again. That all changed when I began work as a park ranger at Fire Tower No. 1. Arlo Bennett National Forest was full of darkness that my father had worked so hard to convince me was only a figment of my imagination. I wish he had been right. I had just finished college with a degree in wildlife conservation not long before the start of the pandemic. Needless to say, this was not a kind time for new graduates. A local pizzeria near campus had provided me with steady hours and a decent paycheck throughout my studies. But with increasing recommendations and closures, my hours had dwindled to a quarter of what I had previously worked. Being hundreds of miles from home and the not-so-proud owner of a rapidly dwindling bank account, I spent hours each day filling out job applications, sending out resumes, and cold-calling every national park and forest that I could find online. Desperation was mounted until I had finally resolved to pack up my belongings and move back to my hometown, tail between my legs. My parents had passed away in a car accident during my sophomore year. I wouldn't be returning to a stable support system, but I was at least confident that old friends and extended family may be able to help me find gainful employment. Steady footing just seemed so far out of reach. Moving day arrived and I finished boxing up the last of my possessions and stacking them haphazardly into the back of a rented box truck. After barely managing to get my beater of a car secured onto the tow dolly, I felt my phone buzz in my pocket. Slumping down onto the tailgate of the box truck, I fished it out and saw a red notification bubble on my mail application and I clicked it. The feeling of joy I experienced can't be accurately described as I read the attached email. Arlo Bennett, National Forest Hiring Authority. Subject. Your application has been chosen for Fire Tower No. 1 in Arlo Bennett National Forest. Mr. Parker, congratulations and welcome to our team here at Arlo Bennett National Forest. We are excited to inform you that as a new park ranger for wildlife services, you will be stationed at Fire Tower No. 1. You are expected to arrive at Ranger Station 3 on, date redacted, at or before 8 a.m. EST. Uniforms, equipment, shelter, and necessities will be provided as this is a 24-7 live-in posting. If you require storage for personal items that you do not wish to keep in your on-site residence, accommodations will be made upon arrival. Please bring a valid driver's license, a social security card, and a copy of this email to be presented upon arrival. If you have any additional questions or concerns, please contact your HR representatives at 606-555-3241 during the hours of 8 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. We thank you for your time and look forward to meeting you. Welcome to the team. Dennis Garland, Superintendent 2, Arlo Bennett National Forest. After reading the email over and over no less than 10 times, tears began to run down my cheeks. I was mildly confused. The email seemed to be informing me that I had already received the job, but I hadn't even done a phone interview. 
I told myself that my resume and application must have been such high quality that it wasn't necessary. Hindsight is 2020. Only minutes ago, I was preparing to drive a box truck full of my second-hand furniture and meager possessions pointlessly toward my old hometown. Now I couldn't wait to travel down the road to my new career and what I thought would be a bright future. Two days and one terrible roadside motel later, I pulled the box truck into a newly empty parking lot in front of a log-sided building with a sign reading, Ranger Station 3. Two well-aged jeeps sat parked side by side in front of the station, both marked clearly as Ranger Patrol vehicles. I couldn't help but smile. There I was, right where I had always wanted to be. With a mixed sensation of pride and terror, I made my way into the ranger station and introduced myself to a man with salt and pepper hair sitting at the desk in the entryway. I introduced myself and was greeted with a vice grip of a handshake, and he identified himself as Superintendent Garland. He explained to me that while he was generally not stationed at this location, he made it a goal to personally meet every newly hired ranger and walk them through the orientation process. Over the next few hours, we filled out a seemingly endless pile of paperwork, drank bad coffee out of chipped mugs, and I listened intently to Superintendent Garland as he explained my job duties at Fire Tower Number 1. None of the duties sounded unusual in any way to start. I would work in a 3x3 grid with fire towers 1-9. to nine. For the first two weeks of the month, I would man the tower from 5am to 5pm. A reserve staff member would report to the station to give you a day off to readjust your sleep schedule for the last half of the month. For the following two weeks, I would work from 5pm to 5am. Each tower in the grid was staggered by the shift to watch neighboring off-duty sectors around them as well as their own. The primary concern was to watch for the inception of forest fires. Lightning strikes and unauthorized campfires were a constant concern in this area, so around-the-clock surveillance was necessary. All fire tower rangers were provided with a two-bedroom, one-bathroom cabin located at the base of the tower. They were fully furnished and basic sundries were provided for your first week in the job, with the expectation that you provide your own groceries and toilet the trees thereafter. Routine maintenance of the cabin and tower was to be performed by the occupying ranger. Mr. Garland also informed me that I would work four weeks on duty, with one full week off to follow. Reserve staff would report to the cabin at each tower, to relieve the primary attendant to allow them some rest and relaxation. The second bedroom was to be reserved for them, and we were to keep it free of personal items. One exception to this rule was in the event a camper or hiker was retrieved during a search and rescue, until they could be evacuated to the nearest town by medical staff. As he wrapped up, I was smiling ear to ear. Dream job check, rent free living check. After a worrying season of my life, everything seemed to be going my way. I was already making a mental checklist of what personal items to keep in the cabin, and what I would need to store in the provided shed when Mr. Garland's gruff voice unexpectedly pulled me out of my daydream. One more thing, he said, eyes locking with mine. Don't travel any farther than a half a mile or so north of Tower 1. Oh, sure thing, I replied. No problem at all, but is there any particular reason? Mr. Garland stared at me in silence for a moment, and I could tell that he was trying to sort out an answer. Dangerous woods that way, son, he finally responded. Bobcats and bears, a nasty business. I nodded politely, but it wasn't a terribly satisfying answer. My father and I had camped in that forest for years, and had always known predatory wildlife lived throughout the entirety of the reserve area. Unless the bobcats had learned to ride the bears to hunt people down, it seemed unlikely to be any more dangerous than any other area. Regardless, it seemed like a poor plan to argue or question my new employer before my first shift even began. 
He shook my hand and gave me a few pointers as he walked me to the door. I picked up a duffel bag that they had prepared for me that was sitting in a chair by the door. Heading out to the box truck, I tried to reignite my excitement and invigoration for my new job. But the warning that Superintendent Garland had given me, it still circled inside my mind ominously. Don't go north. At that moment, I fully intended to adhere to the direction. But soon my curiosity sent me barreling down a dangerous path. My first week at the cabin and tower was a whirlwind of information. The ranger currently occupying my new tower, Thomas Richardson, was a reserve ranger who filled in the off weeks of towers one to three. As he helped me unload my box truck and unhook my car, I picked his brain for every piece of advice that I could think to ask. He had worked for the ranger service there for a little less than a decade. I was surprised to learn that he had originally been offered the permanent role in Fire Tower Number 1, a significant pay increase from reserve status, but he had declined. He said that he loved traveling to the different towers and changing the scenery that each one offered. He seemed like a very genuine and helpful man, but at the back of my mind, I couldn't help but wonder if whatever could be found north of the tower drove him to decline the position. So, do you ever do any hiking or camping when you're off duty? I asked on our last day together. Yeah, at least once a month or so, Thomas replied. I would say I probably hiked or explored everything within about five miles of the fire towers. That seemed like as good of a chance as any to naturally ask Thomas about the area north of the tower. I've got a pretty good grasp on the territory to the east, south, and west but is there much worth checking out north of the tower? I looked intently in his direction, but he never returned my gaze. Thomas stood up quickly and began to pack his hiking bag without making eye contact. He tossed it over his shoulder and made his way to the door toward the wraparound stairs. Once he had made it outside, he turned and looked at me with a determined face. North of the tower isn't safe, buddy. He turned and began to walk down the stairs toward his jeep. Bobcats and bears that way stay clear. A few seconds later, I could hear the roar of his engine and the sound of gravel scattering beneath tires as his jeep made its way down the road. I was surprised by his sudden departure and lack of a formal farewell. It wasn't as if I wouldn't see him again in three weeks when he returned to give me my days off but for such a friendly guy it seemed like a rude exit. A bit of clarity from Thomas had been what I was expecting, but uh, I was just left with a lead weight in my stomach and a slight feeling of dread. The answer had been so quick it seemed as though that he had practiced it, matched with the dash for the door. I was sure something worse than wildlife must be located somewhere in these woods. That evening after my shift had ended, I radioed the two towers in my grid that would be assuming the night watch. Before departing the tower, we had to verify that they were safely on watch. After receiving an affirmative message from both, I began to shut down all of the tower equipment other than the radio and gather up my belongings. There was still a bit of daylight left, so I seized the opportunity to grab a few odds and ends from the storage shed to bring inside. I had mostly settled into the cabin, but there was still a barren bookshelf in the corner that was begging for some of my tattered paperbacks. I dumped the old cardboard box on the floor by the shelf and sat on the hardwood floor. Sitting cross-legged, I opened the box and began to scoop out the haphazardly stored novels and arrange them on the particle board shelf. The bottom was filled and I was just beginning to load up the top shelf with the last of my New York Times bestsellers when I noticed something was sitting behind the lip of the bookshelf. I reached my hand into the corner and pulled out a worn leather book. There were no markings on the front or back to identify what it was or who it may have belonged to. Thumbing it open to a page marked with an attached leather bookmark, I could see the winding loops of cursive handwriting. Not a book, so to speak, but a journal. Must have belonged to a ranger who had manned the station before me. 
Momentarily, I considered reading it but decided against it. Tossing it on top of the bookshelf, I made a mental note to give it to Mr. Garland the next time that I saw him. Maybe he could return it to the rightful owner. After stowing away my books, I took the cardboard box outside and started walking down the gravel path to the storage building. There was a steel cage to place garbage in, in an attempt to keep larger wildlife from rifling through the bins. I reached down to my hip to retrieve my jingling set of keys to unlock the disposal gate. Setting the box down, I slid the key into the lock and I opened the gate. As I reached down to retrieve the box, I could hear something off in the distance. By then, the light of day was a distant memory and my eyes had not yet adjusted to the darkness. Years of living in the city had made me forget just how dark the forest could be. I had still gone on the occasional hiker camping trip with classmates, but it had usually been a pay-to-stay campsite with bathroom-shower combination and pathways lit up with soft wattage light bulbs. It hadn't occurred to me to switch on the light that extended to the storage shed. My visibility was aided only by the light of the cabin's front porch, which was swallowed up by the walls of darkness. And that is when the whistling began. It was soft and indistinct, but I could hear it nonetheless. The crunching of leaves and the snapping of twigs in the distance accompanied the unidentifiable tune. I was unable to move as I attempted to locate the direction that it was coming from, but my efforts were fruitless. While the sound seemed to be coming from one point far off in the distance, I could also hear traces of it all around me. Before Thomas had left, we went over to the camping permit logs for our grid and there were none requested within 10 miles of my post. Although the most popular hiking trails were equally far away so there was little to no reason for anyone to be traveling in that area at this time of night. The only trails nearby were less traveled and given to more experienced hikers. Anyone with the skill to travel those trails would also have the common sense to go and set up camp for the night. As I stood listening and squinting in the darkness, I couldn't help but feel like the ten-year-old boy from so many years ago, but this time I didn't have my father to comfort me. That night around the fire he was able to explain all of this in a way that made me believe my imagination had just run away with me. Standing there by myself, I felt none of that certainty. The whistling grew louder and more distinct as I stood frozen in the darkness. Where before it was a disembodied and distant voice, I could tell that the source was moving in my direction. There was a haunting yet beautiful melody that I was able to hear more clearly. Crunching leaves and snapping twigs seemed to be just outside my field of vision. It was almost hypnotizing. My eyes began to close and relaxation began to settle into my bones. I see fear had melted away leaving me in a state of near bliss. I felt like it may be a good idea to just walk toward the source of the beautiful melody. It's this way, I heard a soft voice say. Come and see. The feeling of relaxation washed over me almost as quickly as it had begun. Where the melodic whistling had lulled me into a stupor, the sudden call from the darkness had sobered me to the situation. I stumbled backward toward the cabin and began to run toward the safety of the burning bulb. My heavy footfalls washed out all the noises from moments before. As I ran, I imagined some malevolent creature mere steps behind me, claws outstretched toward my back, still beckoning me to come and see whatever was in the darkness of the forest. Once I reached the front door, I pushed my way inside slammed the door and engaged the deadbolt and slid onto the floor. My back against it, I simply sat panting and trying to listen for any signs of activity outside. There was no whistling, no footsteps on the walkway or the porch, no knocking. It was just the noise of my gulping breath and the thunder of my heart against my ribcage. After a few minutes, I was able to collect myself enough to put a plan together. 
If there was someone out there, maybe they were in danger. I went to the control room in the cabin and threw on the breakers to these spotlights, located around the perimeter of the cabin, fire tower, and storage building. Through the blinds of the cabin, I could see the piercing beams of artificial light. Before leaving the control room, I grabbed a floodlight and a hunting rifle from the rack. Slowly, I disengaged the deadbolt to the door and I stepped outside. The forest was now a terrifying combination of artificial light and obscenely long shadows cast by the spotlights. I made my way back down the gravel trail toward the storage building. The whistling had begun just beyond the storage shed. I turned on the handheld floodlights and began to sweep the tree line looking for anyone or anything that may have hung around. Nothing, not a single thing. For all of the crunching leaves and breaking branches that I heard, there was no sign that anything had moved through the area recently. Nothing larger than a squirrel at least. I continued sweeping the distance with the floodlights when I heard the ping of an incoming call on the fire tower watch radio. The sound made me jump and I dropped the light to the ground with a heavy thud. As my heart calmed, I scooped up the light and headed toward the tower. Already out of breath after running from the storage building, the ascent at the top of the tower was painfully slow. I finally reached the lookout box and I turned on the light. Tower 1, this is Tower 5. Do you copy? I punched the button on the radio mic. I read to Tower 5. Go for Tower 1. Tower 1, status check. The voice said. I can see your spotlights over there, Tower 5. Everything okay? I immediately felt embarrassed and didn't want to explain the commotion of the evening. Everything's all clear, I responded. I just... Thomas explained how to use the spot system, but I wanted to give it a hands-on run. I'll cut him now. Again, everything is all clear. I thanked the ranger and headed down to the cabin and into the control room to cut the light system off. Hand trembling on the switch, I hesitated. As scared and tired as I had been, I knew that I had to take one last look outside before shutting off the lights. Pulling the cord and the blinds, I looked outside. In the distance at the edge of the spotlights, I thought I could see someone walking into the darkness of the wood line. My heart began to hammer again as I pulled my phone out of my pocket, trying to snap a picture but they vanished before I had managed to open up the application. Before I returned my phone to my pocket, a curious thought had occurred to me. Thumbing through my applications, I finally found the one that I was looking for. A digital compass popped up on the screen and the needle bounced side to side as my hand shook. Once I was able to settle my nerves, the needle finally came to a rest. It pointed to the north. To say that I was on the edge for the next few days would have been an understatement. My night shift rotation was quickly approaching. While I hadn't seen or heard anything alarming since the night that Thomas had departed, I had also taken special care to avoid the opportunity. No more nighttime traveling out to the storage shed. No taking the trash out in the evening. If I needed to complete any outdoor tasks, I made sure to take care of them during sundown. I had mostly convinced myself that it was all in my imagination, but... The thought still rolled around in the back of my head. Maybe I saw and heard exactly what I thought I had. Immediately after my shift each day, I shut down all lookout equipment except the radio and headed directly down to the cabin. My evenings consisted of a steady schedule of TV show binging, dinner, a shower, and reading in bed. The small supply of paperback books that I had bought didn't provide as much entertainment as I had hoped. Most of them I'd already read about a dozen times, and I quickly thumbed through the few that hadn't lost all of their appeal. The paperback that I was reading lost most of its luster, and I put it aside on the nightstand, and I gazed at the bookshelf to see if something else caught my eye. And that's when I saw that journal again. Shuffling out of bed into the bookshelf, I scooped up the journal and tucked myself back beneath my blanket. Initially, I had told myself it was immoral to read somebody else's private journal. But still, the odd feeling that place gave me and the lack of other engaging activities made it easier than it should have to justify reading just a few pages. I flipped open the cover to the first page 
and I ran my hand over the indentations of the cursive writing on the page. Although I had told myself that, I would only read a few pages that turned into about a quarter of the journal. The beginning introduced me to its writer, Gary Vincent, and his arrival in what would later be my cabin. Entry 1 was dated roughly two years before I had arrived, and told the uneventful story of his early life, education, and acceptance of the ranger position at Fire Tower 1, in Arlo Bennett National Forest. Our stories were fairly similar in many respects, but Gary seemed to have skipped the period of self-loathing and desperation before his employment there. While not the most energetic or entertaining read that I've ever come across, there was something enjoyable about learning the personal thoughts of who I assumed was my predecessor. Thomas had trained him as well, and the two of them seemed to have developed a good friendship, if Gary's words were to be believed. The two of them camped and hiked the area together and enjoyed their shared time at the cabin when Thomas came to relieve Gary for his days off. I was beginning to nod, in and out of alertness having finished about a third of the journal when an entry had jolted me back to attention. So, there seems to be something weird going on around here. I love everything about living and working in the forest, but now and again... I just get that feeling that something's watching me. I can't quite put my finger on what brings the sensation. It's the same feeling you get when somebody stands behind you in a room, but doesn't say anything. Just an electric charge, a sensation. Last night I was hauling the kitchen trash out to the good old dumpster dungeon when I heard someone whistling out in the woods. I always check the camping permits at the start and end of my shift so, if there is an emergency, I can get out and help them out. But the thing is, there are no permits out this far that we had on record today. I tried calling out to the person whistling, but they would just fall silent whenever I did. A few minutes later, this little tune would pick back up. I would try calling out again, but it was just the same. No more whistling for a minute. There was a time or two I thought someone was telling me to come and look at something, but I'm not sure. I headed into the control room and grabbed a flashlight to search the area, but after a half hour or so of stumbling around in the woods, I called it quits. I didn't see anyone or hear any more whistling. I haven't really been out here all that long, but maybe the lack of daily interaction with people is just making my mind act funny. I don't know, but I'm not too worried about it. If whistling is the worst thing that I hear, I think I'll be in pretty good shape. I read the passage over and over. The same thing that happened to Gary. The only noticeable difference was my total panic compared to Gary's cool and collected approach to investigating the area. I assumed that he hadn't experienced the same event as a child, but it was almost impossible to believe that this wouldn't have seemed kind of strange to him. A second difference also occurred to me. Gary hadn't seen anyone in the wood line. I wasn't positive that I saw a person, but I was certain that I had seen something. Too engaged with these similarities of the journal, I knew that I would be up for the rest of the night until I had finished it. I got out of bed again and headed into the kitchen to make myself a pot of coffee. After the ancient machine had spilled the last drop into the pot, I poured a mugful and settled into the kitchen table to continue my reading. The pages immediately following the whistling event were more of the same day and day out stream of thought entries that you would expect until about three months later. This place is starting to mess with my mind a little bit. I was outside last night doing my usual dumpster run when I started hearing that whistling again. Honestly, I had forgotten about the last time that it had happened until 10 or so last night. I tossed the trash in the cage when the whistling had started up. The flashlight was already in my pocket this time. I started carrying it a few weeks ago just as a precaution. It was louder this time and something about it just made me happy. Just felt like I could wander in that direction and hear it a little bit better if I could find who was making that beautiful noise. It kind of made me sad too though. I'm not sure why. I flipped on the flashlight and started walking north into the woods to see if I could find out who it was. 
I called out and asked who was there. This time, someone shouted back, It's this way, come and see. I asked them what it was, but no one answered. When I started walking toward the sound of the voice, I could hear footsteps and the whistle moving away from me. So I called out again for them to wait. I just wanted to talk to them. They just repeated the same thing. It's this way, come and see. By now I figured that there must be something to check out so I kept walking after them. Maybe somebody was hurt. Probably not though. If they were hurt, why would they be whistling? My mind was kind of foggy and the melody made the traveling feel a little bit easier though. I felt kind of happy like something good was going to happen. The woods were starting to get thicker and I wasn't gaining on them. They always seemed to be just the same distance in front of me as they had been the entire time. Occasionally I would catch a glimpse of someone in my flashlight beam and I would call out but still the same old thing. It's this way, come and see. Eventually, I came to a cluster of oak trees that were so tightly packed together that they looked like one monstrous tree. When I got to it, the whistling stopped for a little while and suddenly I felt sad. My eyes teared up and I wasn't sure why. Then the whistling tune came back like it sensed that I needed it again to be happy. It sounded like it was up on the top of the trees. I tried shouting for them again a few times, but nobody answered at first. After a few minutes of trying to get their attention, I finally heard someone reply. It's up here, come see. Up where? I asked the voice. In the trees, just use the stairs. The voice called back. I ran the flashlight around the base of the trees and in the center. I could see what looked like a step. Inching closer and leaning between two of the oaks, I could see a spiral staircase running up the center of the trees and into the foliage. I started walking forward. The banister felt so smooth under my hand. I wanted to see where it went. For a moment, it felt like it was the right thing to do. Just grab onto the banister and climb up to the top. My foot was just settling onto the bottom step when a vibration startled me back to my senses. My smartwatch was beeping loudly. And when I looked down, I saw my heart rate was nearly 150 beats a minute. I saw the time too. It had only been 10 o'clock when I headed to take the trash out, but it was almost 11.30 now. Seemed like I had only been in the woods for maybe 15 minutes, but it had been an hour and a half. I panicked and headed back in the direction of the cabin. As I made my way back, there was the remnant of an old hiking trail that took me within a stone's throw of the cabin. It took me almost two hours to get back. My body aches and I feel like I have the flu. I'm not sure what the heck that was that was out there, but I'm going to have to call this in at the start of my shift. My heart raced and I continued reading the journal. In the next few pages, Gary recounted how he had called on the staircase to Superintendent Garland the next day. A team of rangers had met him at the cabin. They traveled back to the location where Gary had seen the stairs, but they couldn't find anything out of the ordinary. Gary begged them to go back at night, thinking maybe that they would see it again. The other rangers agreed in an effort to calm Gary's concerns, but the nighttime trip was no different. There was nothing there. The journal entries from that point became almost incoherent in their format. Gary was fixated on how the stairs had disappeared and why they couldn't find them. He admitted traveling back multiple times but never seeing them again. The absence of the whistling also seemed to bother him rather than soothe his worried mind. He wrote endlessly about missing the beautiful melody and then it maddened him that he couldn't remember all of the notes. And then there was no entry for a long period. Weeks passed between. When Gary wrote what would be his final entry in the journal, he seemed to be a man who had lost grip on reality. The music didn't return to me. I had been so sad without it. The gentle melody haunted my mind even though I couldn't quite remember how it sounded. So I traveled back again. 
Down the forgotten path, I traveled north, traveled to that unusual corpse of trees. And there it was. The stairs were back, thank God. They were there, no one was whistling, and no voice had invited me up, but I knew that I needed to go. I belonged there, with them and with him. He was waiting for me. The banister felt so good under my hand as I made my way up, into the foliage, through the branches, into my new home. Everyone is in unison there. The many are one. I came back here to say goodbye to someone. Was there someone here that I knew? I'll just say goodbye to you, journal. I'm going back. I know that I will stay. I want to be in unison. Maybe I can help others find their way there. I hope that you will let me help. So many souls can be one if they let themselves go. To anyone who reads these words, take heart. It is this way. Come and see. That was it. Nothing but blank pages followed. I was shaking as I closed the leather cover and stared into my empty coffee cup. The sun was creeping over the tops of the trees and I knew that if I didn't move soon, I would be late for the start of my shift. I put on a fresh pot of coffee and began to ready myself in a daze. The journal stayed, clutched in my hand as though if it were some talisman that may protect me from Gary's fate. I didn't know exactly what to do in the long run then, but I knew that I had to get to my post. Months had passed since I discovered the journal and spring was quickly approaching. I would periodically hear the whistling in the woods on evenings when I didn't have to work. The height of the fire tower probably just made it impossible for the melody to reach my ears when I worked nights, but I always assumed that it was there. When the whistling would begin in the evenings, I would put in a pair of earplugs to block it out. It seemed to keep me from feeling that unreasonable sensation to follow the haunting melody. Although it yielded no satisfying information, I shared the journal and its contents with Mr. Garland and Thomas. Mr. Garland explained that Gary Vincent had been a stellar employee for two years, but confided in me that he had a history of mental illness. While they explained his complicated situation, Thomas handed me a photo of Gary. He was a few years older than me with bright red hair and a huge smile. They told me that Gary suffered from something similar to schizophrenia. It had been well controlled with medication for quite some time. Once Gary went missing, Thomas and the other rangers found a month's worth of his medicine in the medicine cabinet of the cabin. He had taken to traveling into the northern forest more frequently in the last few months. Thomas Garland and a host of other rangers had traveled to the location with Gary, that he had claimed to have seen the stairs and that there was nothing unusual. Each unsuccessful search seemed to cause him to become a little more distant from them, until eventually they all quit talking unless it had to do with work. The two of them implored Gary to seek help, but he never did and then he vanished into the woods. The subsequent search for him only turned up his tattered uniform and his wallet. For my part, I continued doing my job. I liked the night shift the best because there was no whistling. Staring out into the darkness for a few hours, looking for fire, soothed my worried mind. My phone ran a constant stream of music to keep me company. When I worked the day shift, I would bring Gary's journal with me and study, as though perhaps I would discover some secret to his madness. I never did. It just seemed to provide a madness of my own that I was obsessed with what had happened to him. I honestly can't tell you why I decided to do what I did next, but the mystery had become more than I could take. Thomas arrived to start my week of duty and I told him that I planned to do some camping. He seemed excited to have the cabin to himself for a few days. The day before he arrived, I had already unloaded the ATV in the storage shed with the camping gear and extra gas. I was going to go find that staircase. As soon as Thomas had started his shift, I fired up the ATV and headed on the trail to the east of the tower so that he would be less likely to discover my plan. 
I drove the ATV in a wide arc around the Tower 1 sector until I was about a quarter mile due north of the tower. It took me a while, but after hours of searching, I found the rutted trail that Gary had written about in his journal. The trip was uneventful and with the use of the ATV, I reached the tightly gathered copse of trees in no time. I slid off the ATV and approached the cluster of trees with caution. They formed a tight circle with a three-foot gap facing toward the south. The canopy shadowed the interior, making it impossible to see what was inside. With a lump in my throat, I pulled the floodlight off the ATV, and I aimed it at the circle of trees. There was nothing inside other than fallen leaves and a few dry branches. My pulse relaxed and my body tension eased. The staircase wasn't there. I felt a mixture of joy and sadness. Gary had seemed so sure of what he had seen and now he felt sure that he had been suffering from hallucinations. Thomas said that he hadn't taken it in months. A sorrowful picture of a man who had lost grip on reality filled my mind. Walking inside the cops, I couldn't find anything out of the ordinary. Feeling content that the staircase was only a fantasy, I decided to make the most of my days off and follow through with the camping trip. The day was warmer than the seasonal average, so I chose to forego the tent and camp out under the stars. I was only going to be staying overnight, so I opted to not dig a latrine, and I concentrated on setting up a comfortable fire after clearing the brush. Even with the unusually warm day, I still gathered an abundant amount of firewood, just in case it took a substantial dip in temperature. After a quick meal and a few chapters in one of my ragged paperback novels, I decided it was time to turn in for the night. I settled into my sleeping bag and enjoyed the heat from the stone-rimmed fire. It was only moments before I was fast asleep. Sometime during the night, I awoke to a familiar sound. The melody that I had avoided for so many months now was filling my ears, and it was coming from directly behind me. I rolled over and looked into the copse of trees. Standing in the gap between the oaks was Gary. I recognized his wide smile and fire-red hair from the photo that Thomas had shown me. Gnarled tufts of hair sprouted in random directions, and his tattered ranger's uniform hung off his emaciated frame. Gary? I asked in a daze. He just continued, giving me that unsettling smile as he stepped backwards and was enveloped in the darkness of the circle of oak trees. I could hear what sounded like the thuds of hiking boots on wooden boards. Springing from my sleeping bag and grabbing the floodlight, I yelled at Gary's name again. It's up here, come see, he replied in a manic voice. I turned on the flashlight and aimed it into the trees, expecting to see him hunkered inside, but to my shock, the beam of my floodlight gleamed off a polished mahogany banister. There was a beautifully crafted circular staircase in the center of the trees. Lifting my floodlight, I caught the bottom of Gary's boot as he ascended the stairs. Shouting his name, I sprinted inside. Gary, no, I shrieked. My hand grabbed the smooth, cold wood as I began to climb the stairs in their tight circle. Come back, man. We need to get you some help. I could only hear the thuds of his footfalls as he continued upward. My pulse was racing as I bounded up behind him, clinging tightly to the banister. Leaves and branches traced the side of my face as we both climbed higher into the trees. The beam of my floodlight bounced and weaved between smooth mahogany wood and dense foliage. As hard as I climbed the stairs, I could hear that Gary was getting farther ahead of me. My pace was beginning to slow, but I still clung to the banister, using it to pull myself up as I tried to reach the man racing ahead of me. The smoothness of the wood began to change under my hand as I climbed higher. What had been an unblemished surface began to feel bumpy and rigid on my palm. I was starting to breathe heavily through my mouth and I knew that I would need to rest soon. In exhaustion, I decided to try to stop and catch my breath. 
The beam of my floodlight was pointed toward the stairs, but they looked different than they had when I first saw them. Where there had been a rich brown at the bottom, they now appear the color of half-burnt charcoal. I traced the light up higher to get a better view of my surroundings, and I discovered why the banister felt so different. The smooth wood had transitioned into what looked like an unending spinal cord. The bones curled upward, wrapping around the charcoal steps like a pale snake. The foliage around me which had been budding in green when I started my ascent was now the sickly purple of a healing black eye with throbbing veins running through the leaves. Balls of black dew dotted the tops of the leaves. I noticed that anywhere this dew had made contact with my clothes, small holes appeared, and I could smell the light scent of chemical burn and hints of decay. The branches of the trees made sudden pattern changes from obsidian to ash and white. I began to scream and turned to go back down when I saw the section of steps below me crumble and fall away into nothingness. There was no way that I had climbed more than the equivalent of six flights of stairs, but I watched as chunks of the burnt charcoal platform and spinal cord banister drifted off into a purple chasm. As I tried to gain my composure and figure out what to do next, I could feel the step below me beginning to crack and sink. Without another thought, I began to run up the stairs as quickly as I could. All the while, I could hear the step just behind me crumble and drop off into the purple abyss below. There would be no more breaks to catch my breath. I couldn't even afford to glance backward unless I wanted to end up drifting off into whatever unknown abyss ran below. The air seemed to get thinner and had the tang of rotting meat. I could feel my legs buckling and struggling to keep up with the stairs and I knew that I would soon fall back into what was below. Just as I felt the last of my strength gave away, my hand reached for another section of the spinal banister but found on the empty air. My foot rose to find one more burnt charcoal step but instead, it extended forward and found no purchase. I fell forward onto level ground. My floodlight flickered across the ground revealing a gray and writhing field before me. It was damp and I could feel it pulse beneath my palms. I jumped up in a panic to get my hands off of the disgusting material. My hand shook violently as flecks of gray sludge flew wildly from my fingers. I was wiping the rest of the muck onto my pant legs when I lifted my eyes to the scene before me. The sky was a flowing haze of purple full of a thick fog. There was no variation to this gray terrain. It writhed and shifted as far as I could see. Dotted over the landscape were thin, leafless trees swaying lazily in the cold wind. As my eyes focused in the low unearthly light, I realized that they weren't trees at all. They were emaciated people. Thousands of them with bone-thin arms raised, reaching toward the sky. Some of their feet were held in place by skeletal hands emerging from the ground, while others seemed to be growing into a gray mass like a plant. Their eyes glowed softly with the same purple light as the sky. All at once, the numberless horde turned their heads towards me and spoke. We are many, but we are one in him. Thousands of voices said in unison. You have heard this beautiful song, and now you will sing it with us forever. A few yards in front of me stood Gary. The same sick purple glow flowed from his eyes, but he stood with his arms at his side. He motioned with both hands to a spot just beside him, and smiled at that unsettling smile. On the ground where he pointed were two writhing skeletal hands. You've heard the song, he said in a dreamy voice. This is where you belong, with us. I wanted to beg him to go back with me, to tell him that it wasn't too late, that we could help him if he would only let us. Staying there was madness. He had been twisted into something that he was. Before I could say anything, I started to feel that it wasn't as twisted as it had first seemed. 
The melody that I had heard so many times in the woods echoed everywhere now. The forest of skyward reaching people produced an overpowering wave of sound, as they all whistled the same hauntingly beautiful melody. I started to walk toward Gary and thought that this all made sense. Everyone here looks so happy. The purple of this world was even beginning to become beautiful to me. I was nearly halfway to Gary when I halted for a moment and looked over my shoulder. There was an opening in the ground where the stairs had been. My head darted from side to side and I could see more of these openings in the ground between these swaying forests of humans. There must be hundreds of these staircases leading up to this world. From my world, I realized, bringing people from our world to this brainwashing place. Looking back at Gary, I could see that same smile as before, but there was a nervousness to it. It was almost a pleading with me to step aside and accept those skeletal hands and allow them to wrap around my ankles. But then I noticed the tears running down his face and the ever so subtle shaking of his head. He was trying to tell me no. Before I could ask him to tell me where we were, to ask what the heck was going on or what was happening there, I was startled by the deafening sound. It was almost like a foghorn, but so much deeper. My bones shook violently. The ground beneath me quaked and the beautiful melody from the forest of people suddenly turned into a blood-curdling shriek. Their hands dropped from the sky and covered their ears and I did the same. The second boom of the foghorn came and the writhing forest lifted their heads mouths opening until their jaws nearly unhinged. Thin streams of blue and yellow smoke drifted out of them, swirling together into a twisting cloud above our heads. It began to funnel into a stream and drifted into the distance. My eyes followed the tip of the swirling stream until I saw something moving far in the distance. It was mountainous, larger than anything that I had ever seen. The colossal silhouette was robed in fog, but I could still make out the shape. It towered above the field, blocking out the purple glow of the distant horizon. It seemed to sprout out of the ground into a thick torso with arms so thin that they seemed like they would snap if they were made to hold any weight. At the end of these bony arms, I could see clawed hands, scooping up people trapped in the gray ground in front of it. An oval-shaped mouth with two ivory protruding husks split open from its squat, stocky head. A cavernous mouth full of slender, sharp teeth gleamed in the sickening light. Two clawed hands shoved handfuls of screaming people into its mouth, in between long drinks from the blue and yellow smoke that drifted towards it. They are blessed to become one with him. The forest of humans shrieked. He will welcome you too. Come and see. The appearance of the eldritch horror was more than I could bear. I stumbled backward and fell to the ground as the gray mass writhed underneath my hands again. Using my feet, I pushed myself back toward the hole that I had emerged from and looked back at Gary. He was still crying, but he was nodding in agreement now as I got closer to the hole. I could see now that he was held in place by the same writhing hands that he was gesturing toward. Frozen in place, I thought for a moment that I would run to Gary and drag him with me. He must have seen it in my eyes. His smile faded as his brows furrowed and his lips pulled back in a pain-filled grimace. Go! He screamed, voice filled with agony. It's too late for us. Go! I broke my gaze with Gary and looked into the sky at the impossibly large abomination towering over the forest of tortured souls. Its massive hand broke through the fog and reached for me. Without another thought, I pushed myself back into the hole and closed my eyes. Floating in an endless void was better than allowing that ageless horror to consume me or add me to its blasphemous garden of souls. The sensation of falling was terrifying and my stomach began to ball up tightly. I could feel myself moving faster and faster as the sickening purple void swirled around me. My eyes closed and I prayed that I would die soon to spare me from the nightmare. 
That is when I began to feel a sharp pain in my back as something began to strike me. I opened my eyes, but it was almost completely dark now. My body was slamming against solid objects, knocking the wind from my lungs. My descent began to slow and I could feel something soft and angular brush against my face as my body continued to be pummeled with the blow after blow. My eyes were beginning to focus on the growing light and I could see that I was slamming into tree branches. Extending my arms, I was able to briefly grasp onto them to slow my fall. After what felt like hours, I landed with a sickening thud on the ground, and everything went black. When I came to, I was in front of the abnormal circle of trees. Dirt and saliva were caked in my face and my vision swam with ripples from the impact. I sucked in panicked breaths as I looked at these smooth mahogany stairs only a feet in front of me. My entire body ached but I pushed myself up and staggered to the ATV to retrieve the gas can. Fuel spilled out of the upturned can as I dumped the contents at the foot of those stairs. I pulled a book of matches from my pocket and I flicked it into the trees. A rush of warmth hit me as the fire swallowed the stairs and the trees surrounding them. My vision began to swim again and I felt unconsciousness wash over me once again. I woke up in a hospital in my hometown. Thomas was asleep in an armchair beside my bed. He had awoke when I started shifting in the bed while attempting to make myself comfortable. My left arm was in a cast as well as my left leg. Reaching up to scratch my head, I could feel missing patches of hair. I was covered in bruises and cuts from head to toe. Thomas told me that they had found me after he spotted rising smoke from the lookout booth in fire tower number one. When the rangers and forestry services arrived, they found me at the foot of the blazing trees. I had been in the hospital for three days and had been in and out of consciousness. He asked me repeatedly what had happened, but I lied and told him that I wasn't sure. After Mr. Garland was informed that I was awake, he stopped by for a visit too. It was pretty similar to my visit with Thomas. He told me what had happened from his perspective and asked what had happened. I already practiced at lying about the whole ordeal. I told him that I didn't know. I had gone camping and woke up in the hospital. I wasn't fired from my job, but I never returned to fire tower number one. The ranger service investigated the fire and while they were able to ascertain that, it had been intentionally set. I was not suspected due to my battered state when they had discovered me. The last that I had spoken with him, Thomas told me that he had accepted the full-time position at fire tower number one, and I wished him good luck. As for me now, I've taken a traveling position with the National Forestry Service. I travel the country performing survey studies of the national forests under our care. It's been nice to see the country and I still spend every available moment I have hiking and camping. My motivation is a bit different now. In every new town that I travel to, I always ask the locals if there are any local legends about whistling in the woods. I'm always looking for staircases in places that they should not be. I'll never forget what I saw in that purple tinted place. What haunts me the most is remembering those hundreds of holes that I knew must lead to hundreds of different staircases. I always listen for whistling in the woods now, and I always carry an extra can of gas. <laughs>